Good morning. It's hard not to have a warm welcome when you're in Florida coming from Wisconsin. It's actually warmed up there to, into the 50s, which is unusual. Uh, about a month ago, the wind chill was minus 24, so <laughs> it's pretty cold. But it's nice to be here. I'm with my wife, Amy. You can meet her at the table in, in between services. But it is an honor to be here. I have a very exciting, very powerful presentation for you this morning. And I have to warn you, uh, James 1.19 says be slow to speak. But it doesn't say speak slow. <laughs> so I go really fast. We're going to cover a lot in a very short period of time. And since most of you don't know me from uh, a hole in the ground, I'm going to go over my background very quickly here. Um, that's me, and that's a hole in the ground. <laughs> so... I just put that up there as a warning. I have a very dry sense of humor that you have to put up with for a while. Uh, but I was raised in a Christian home, and you can see very clearly that that is a Christian home. And my mom actually led me to Christ when I was five years old, backyard Bible study clubs. I was very thankful and indebted to my parents for the upbringing that I had. I think uh, sometime after that, I went bowling, and now I'm here. So that kind of brings you up to speed. <laughs> but... Actually, graduated from high school, went to a Christian college, John Brown University in Arkansas, to study mechanical engineering. Got a degree there, but then I became more interested in physics. They didn't have a physics major, so I left there and went back to Wisconsin, went to the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater to get a degree in physics, and that's when my world changed quite a bit. Going from a small Christian college where my engineering professors opened up every class in prayer to a large state university where my physics professors did not open up in prayer, and maybe they forgot, I should have reminded them. <laughs> um, they were all evolutionists, some of them were atheists, and they were telling me that everything I believed was wrong. <laughs> and that made me very uncomfortable, to be surrounded by those PhD scientists who I assumed had a lot of evidence for what they believed. I found out later they didn't, it's a whole other story. But I realized myself for the first time in my life, I knew what I believed, I just didn't know why. I couldn't defend the Christian worldview, so God put it in my heart to start looking into things. So I've been looking into things for 39 years now uh, and in, been in full-time ministry for about 17 years, traveling around the country and around the world, formed a ministry called the Starting Point Project. It's all about our starting point, that we believe God exists and the Bible is his word. If you come back this evening, you'll hear a lot more about starting points and how important that is. Along the way, I was also invited to be on the board of directors of a group called Logos Research Associates. This is the world's largest group of scientists who are Christians and creationists. The founding member, Dr. John Sanford, he's from Cornell University. He was an atheist for much of his life, very strong Christian now. He's famous for having invented something called the gene gun. It inserts genes into the DNA. Just, again, worldwide famous for that brilliant guy, very humble, very godly man. Then there's Dr. John Baumgartner. He's a Ph.D. geophysicist. He just happened to build the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. <laughs> Even secular geologists use that model to see how plates of the earth are moving. So those, those two guys, myself and a few other board members, and I always say, as brilliant as these guys are, and they are really smart, if they were here with us this morning, they would be the first to admit, out of all eight board members, I am the tallest. So I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty proud of that. And uh, about a year ago, Dr. Sanford, who formed the group, asked if I would step up and take his place as president. So now I'm president of the group, so <laughs> which means I've lost all respect for the rest of the guys. But it's kind of cool hanging around them because they're doing cutting-edge research, and then I get to convert it into something we call English, which is kind of fun. So, quick overview of the ministry. 17 years full-time, given over 3,100 talks all over the U.S., nine other countries. Uh, I just got back about two weeks ago from speaking at the U.S. Naval Academy for the fifth time. Spoken to West Point officers, lead Grand Canyon tours, which you've uh, heard about. We'll talk about that just um, briefly later. Um, started a brand-new podcast a year ago this month, and within a few months, we reached the top 5% in the world, which is just amazing. It's all, all God. It has nothing to do with me. I just try to stay out of his way. And then there are three books that I've written as well. Here's a picture taken from the top of Horseshoe Bend in one of our Grand Canyon tours. So if you go on one of the tours, you will be there seeing that. It's phenomenal. Um, podcasts, again, are, are free, available on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and a few other places. I've uh, written three books that are out on the table. I'll talk about those. The book on creation, I've been told by some of the world's leading scientists that they think it's the best overview that's out there, which I was honored to hear. 
but this is what you paid the big bucks for, this presentation, scientific evidence for the inspiration of the Bible, answering the question, how do we really know that this is actually written by God and not just another religious option for us? We're going to be addressing that here. And as I travel around, I ask Christians, in particular, a specific question. Why are you a Christian? And they'll often say, well, because I believe the Bible. Okay, that makes sense. Why do you believe the Bible? Well, because I'm a Christian. <laughs> and why are you a Christian? Because I believe the Bible. Why do you believe the Bible? Because I'm a Christian. And round and round. Then I ask, well, how do you know that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? And that's usually where I get the deer in the headlights. It's like, uh... <laughs> I just, I mean, I just know. I, I believe it. I feel it. Great. Why should anyone else believe it, including your own children and grandchildren, just because you feel it? You know, we need to go much further than that. Otherwise, we pretty much just have a blind faith. And I'm going to play about a minute and a half or so of a radio interview for you. And here's the background. This program is hosted by an atheist. It's his program. The caller is a pastor. And they're talking about the existence of God. So we'll play it and then we will discuss it. So you disagree because you're, you're convinced, probably because we're on the one, that everybody knows God exists. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you believe we're on the one? Uh, because of the Bible. Okay, why do you believe the Bible? You're a preacher and you're not prepared for a question on why you believe the Bible? I'm not trying to be rude. I just, I mean, this, this to me is like the, the basics. What, why would anybody believe? Why, would, why should I care what the Bible is? The reason, the reason why I'm not prepared for that particular question is because you didn't answer what I had to say. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I might have missed the question. What was the question? Because all I heard was you saying you disagree. Uh, I was trying to make a point with you. It wasn't that serious question. Well, then how can you do it by not answering your question? You didn't answer the question. Uh, your point is that everybody knows that God exists, and I don't agree with that. And I'm asking you to prove that it's true. It's not proven that it's true. Then, then, then we are. never prove that it's true. Then we are in the past. And thank you for acknowledging that you can never prove that it's true, which demonstrates it's a rational. I'm not asking you to call back because we run out of time. Okay, let's close in prayer. <laughs> That'd be pretty depressing right now if we did that, stop there. I actually think that atheist host is very gracious. And I think most pastors, including your own, would have a better response than that. But here's a bigger question this morning. What would your response have been had you called into this program and the atheist host asked you that very logical, rational question? Again, this is where a lot of Christians struggle. Most Christians that I run into, they don't do a great job of answering basic questions. How do you really, really know that God exists? How do you know the Bible's the inspired word of God? We kind of fumble around, and so we're going to be delving into that with the rest of this talk. But I have a quiz for you before we get any further. I'm going to put a passage up on the screen, see if you can tell me where it's found. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because they're redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil. A lot of people say, oh, that's like Isaiah, right? Nope. Jeremiah? Nope. That's not Psalms. No, not Psalms. Here's where it comes from. Second Nephi chapter 2, verse 26. You're like, second what? It's a book of Mormon. It's like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Here's a bigger question. How do you know the Book of Mormon is not the inspired Word of God? Well, it's not. How do you know it's not? Because the Bible is. How do you know the Bible is? Because I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? Because I believe the Bible. What about the Book of Mormon? It's not. Why not? Because the Bible isn't round and round. Those are not good responses. The Mormons believe it's the Word of God. Right on the cover, it's another testament of Jesus Christ given to them by the angel Moroni in golden tablets to Joseph Smith. It's an interesting story. We're not going to be covering that in any detail. And this is just one example. There's no shortage of religious books out there. This is just a small sampling. How do you know which of those are the inspired Word of God? Maybe they all are. Maybe none of them are. Maybe just two. Which two? How would you know? Well, there was a debate a few years ago at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a friend of mine asked me to go. It was between an atheist and a Christian, and the topic was, would the world be better off without religion? 
You wanted me to go you know, and watch the debate. I said, sure, I'll go with you. I said, I would actually never be part of that debate, but I'll, I'll go and listen. He said, why wouldn't you be part of it? I said, because I'm, I'm not a religious person. He said, what are you talking about? You're traveling around the world talking about God and the Bible and Jesus and creation. Here's why I say that. I think religion is man's idea of God. The reason we have so many different religions is there are so many different people. And they all have their own idea of who God is, what he is, what he wants from us, and what happens to you when you die. I don't have time to find out what every single person on the planet thinks about God. On the other hand, I think the Bible is God's idea of God. And that fascinates me to no end. So while I say I'm not a religious person, I am a Christian and I believe the Bible from cover to cover. Now I realize that Christianity is considered to be one of the world's religions. So I guess in that sense I'm a religious person. But I like to make the distinction between man's idea of God and God's idea about himself which makes it even more important. How do we know the Bible really is God telling us about himself and not just another religious option? Now, how many of you have actually a book at home that was signed by the author? A number of you. The rest of you could buy my books. I'll sign them. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's kind of cool. You can get out. Yeah, I met the author. He signed it. Wouldn't it be cool to have an autographed copy of the Bible? (laughs) Kind of makes your head spin thinking about it. I actually think we do. I think God's signature is all over his word. But how would we know that? Well, there are four basic tests that you can apply to any, quote, religious writing out there to see if it gives evidence of actually having been inspired by God. These are not special Bible tests. These are tests you can apply to any book out there. First, we have internal consistency. Does the book you're looking at contradict itself? If it does, that's good evidence. God didn't write that. He wouldn't contradict himself. Historical accuracy. If the book you're looking at gets history wrong, Good evidence God didn't write that. He would know history. Prophetic accuracy. If the book you're looking at makes predictions about the future and they're proven false, good evidence God didn't write that. And then scientific accuracy. If the book you're looking at makes statements that can actually be tested by science and it's been shown and proven to be false and we can all see that, I'd say that's pretty good evidence God didn't write that because God would know science. He actually invented science. With the time that we have, We're going to just focus on this last one, which is also known as scientific foreknowledge. And what's the point? Here's the premise of this. The Bible was written a long time ago, Old Testament roughly 1500, about uh, 400 B.C., and then the New Testament roughly 40, maybe around 100 A.D., long before we had microscopes and telescopes. But yet there are things in the Bible that scientists are seeing, and they're thinking, whoa, those guys were right about that. But they couldn't have known that back then, and that's true. There's no way they could have known that on their own. That's evidence that God was inspiring them what to write, and that's the foundation for the rest of this presentation. But then you have skeptics say, well, no real scientist believes the Bible. Truth is, most major areas of science we have today were founded by Bible-believing Christians. If you'd like some examples, I brought a few along. Antiseptic surgery, bacteriology, calculus, chemistry, computer science, electronics, electrodynamics, electromagnetics, fluid mechanics, galactic astronomy, gas dynamics, genetics, <laughs> hydraulics, hydrostatics, oceanography, optical mineralogy, paleontology, pathology, physical astronomy, stratigraphy, thermodynamics, thermokinetics, vertebrate paleontology, and a scientific method, all founded by Bible believing Christians. Anyone who says no real scientist believes the Bible, they don't only not understand science, they don't even know history. This is where science came from. It was birthed out of the Christian community. Science owes its origins to Christianity. And even secular scientists understand that. They just don't like to admit it or talk about it much. Further truth, not only is belief in evolution not required to do science, belief in evolution actually gets in the way of doing good science. One example is something called vestigial organs. These are things in your body that supposedly don't really do much of anything They used to in earlier stages of evolution, but they're useless now. Here's a quote from Dr. Jerry Coyne, one of the leading evolutionists at the University of Chicago. He said, we humans have many vestigial features proving that we evolved. The most popular is the appendix. Our appendix is simply the remnant of an organ that was critically important to our leaf-eating ancestors, but is of no real value to us. That was the premise. In fact, scientists used to have a list of 86 things in your body that ain't doing anything. (laughs) Well, that'd be evidence of evolution. God's not going to design you with all this stuff that doesn't do anything. 
Well, scientists have studied that list and dwindled it down just a little bit. Um, but this list was actually used at the famous Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925 to prove evolution. But again, they've studied it further and they've dwindled it down to zero. <laughs> they have found a use for every single one of those things, including the appendix. It's part of the immune system. It has a purpose. Can you live without your appendix? Yes, you can. You can also live without your arms. <laughs> it doesn't mean they don't have a purpose. <laughs> Doctors are very hesitant today to take the appendix out. Now, if it's going to burst, you might need to get it out, but otherwise leave it in there. It has a purpose. But it was belief in evolution that led them to just yanking it out left and right. It's not doing anything proof of evolution. Whereas back then, the Christian and creationists would say, we might not fully understand this thing, but we believe it was designed by God, so let's study it further. It led to better science. Another example, the concept of junk DNA. When scientists were looking at DNA, it seemed like only 2% did anything. It coded to make proteins which carry out all the functions in our body. The rest, 98%, junk, useless. Evidence of evolution, God isn't going to design you so that 98% of your DNA doesn't do anything. They've studied that further too. And now they found out the 98% they were calling junk, it's more complex than the 2%. It's instructions telling the 2% what to do. It is blowing them away. I have a whole talk just on DNA. It's kind of cool. Here's a quote from an evolutionist talking about this, quote, junk DNA. He said, the failure to recognize the implications of the non-coding DNA, that was what they were calling junk, will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. Big big mistake to ever call that junk. Creationists weren't doing that. Creationists were saying, let's study it further. It's got to have a purpose, and now we know it does. But then people say, yeah, but the Bible's not a science textbook. And I totally agree with that. It's not. And I'm glad it's not, because fewer people would read it. It'd be harder to understand. And more importantly, it would have to be corrected and updated constantly, like science textbooks. Even though this is God's first shot at writing a book, I think you did a pretty good job. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be updated and corrected like science textbooks. So much that I learned getting a degree in physics has changed. Okay, that's not right anymore. Now we know it's this. Okay, that's wrong. Now we know it's this. Okay, that was wrong. Now we know it's that. That's just kind of how science works. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just very limited and it has to be corrected and updated constantly, but not the Bible. So the Bible isn't a science textbook, but what it does provide for us is what we call a framework through which we understand science because facts don't speak for themselves. Every fact you've ever heard or ever will hear has to be interpreted by whatever framework you are using, your worldview, your starting point. You use what you already believe to look at new stuff and come to a conclusion about it. You need a framework to do that. And the Bible is the only thing that provides a framework for that. We'll be looking at that further tonight. But here are some examples. The Bible does talk about astronomy. Psalm 33, 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. God is the one who created this universe and his fingerprints are all over it. But the secular astronomers will say, Look over here, see these swirling gases out there? It's the birth of a star. It's so beautiful. You are witnessing the birth of a star. You know what you're seeing? Swirling gases. Yeah, but these gases, you know, well, the gravity will pull the particles together to form the star. Hey, gravity wants to do that. I know the formula for that. But the closer these gas particles get together, the more gas pressure there is. And gas pressure is much stronger than gravity. They won't pull together. Okay, well, that's true, but what happened was there was a star here that exploded, and that force pushed those gases together. Okay, interesting story. I got a question. Where did this star come from that exploded? Well, that was swirling gases, and there was a star over here that exploded. And I got another question. You have any idea what it might be? Where did that star come from? The laws of physics mitigate against even the formation of these stars to begin with. And that's just one example. Then we have Jeremiah 33, 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of sea measured, so I multiply the seed of David, my servant. Jeremiah, writing over two and a half thousand years ago, said the stars are uncountable. That probably didn't make any sense to him when he said that. Because he could look up at the night sky and see roughly about 3,000 stars. From any point on the planet, you can look up and see roughly with the naked eye about 3,000 stars. That's a lot of stars, but it's not uncountable. Why would Jeremiah look at a countable number of stars and say they are uncountable? Well, today we know. Modern astronomers tell us there's like 10 trillion, trillion stars out there. 
We don't know how many there are, but it could be something about this number. That's an uncountable number, just like Jeremiah said over two and a half thousand years ago when he didn't have a telescope that we have today. Today we have telescopes. I don't have time to get into the James Webb telescope. A lot of stuff they're discovering like, that can't be. That's impossible. Well, if your worldview is true, that's impossible. But my worldview counts for that perfectly. That would be a whole other talk. We can talk about the Hubble telescope. And a lot of things have been discovered through that. There's something called the Hubble Deep Field. See, astronomers wonder about the universe. Is it pretty much the same everywhere we look? Or are there certain areas where there's lots of stars and galaxies and other areas that are virtually empty? So they took the Hubble telescope and focused it on one small speck of the sky. This is a Hubble deep field. It was 1 24 millionth of the whole sky. Very, very tiny spot. Looked kind of dark. Leave the aperture open for a number of days, see if anything develops. This is what developed in that tiny, tiny, tiny spot. 3,000 stars. But those aren't stars. Those are galaxies. <laughs> 3,000 galaxies, each of which they think has probably 100 billion stars in it, in one area of the sky that's 1 24 millionth of the whole thing. Then they had the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. This is only 1 32 millionth of the night sky, and they discovered 5,500 galaxies, each of which has probably 100 billion stars in it. And then they had the Hubble Legacy Field. They discovered 265,000 galaxies. <laughs> Are the stars uncountable? Yep, just like Jeremiah said over two and a half thousand years ago when he didn't have a telescope because God told him to write the stars are uncountable. I guess the Bible got that right too. The Bible provides a framework for us to properly understand geology. It is an absolute fact there are many layers in the earth. I could go and stand right next to an atheist on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, which I've actually done, and we can both be standing there and notice there are a lot of layers in the earth. That's just a fact. The layers don't say anything. They have to be interpreted. We both have to come up and account for why are we seeing all these layers here. They have a hard time. Come on our, our Grand Canyon tour and you'll learn a lot more. But the Bible explains that. Genesis 6.17 says, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has a breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. The Bible in Genesis 6 through 8 says there was a worldwide flood. If that actually happened, which skeptics make fun of, but if there really was a worldwide flood, what would we expect to see as a result? We would expect to see sedimentary layers that were laid down by water catastrophically that would have probably buried a lot of living things, so you'd expect to see fossils in there too, all over the planet. Guess what we see? We see sedimentary layers laid down catastrophically by water filled with billions and billions of fossils, again, all over the globe. Because the Bible's right, there was a worldwide flood, and the Grand Canyon is one of the best spots on the planet to see evidence for that. I'm going to skip the promo video. You guys have seen it before because you promoted the, the tour here. Uh, you guys have filled the bus. We have room on some of our other tours, so if you're interested in still going, even though that September trip is filled, there are other trips. We've got June, August, a couple others in September, and one in October that you might be able to join in and get more information from us. So I'm going to skip through the promo wow. video here and get to the end. Again, there's brochures out in the back to get more information on that. But our trips are all focused on the authority of God's word. It's not about staring at rocks. Rocks are boring. But when you see the Grand Canyon and you tie it into the flood narrative, you're like, oh my word, I don't have to be embarrassed by the flood story. I will be hoping and praying that people ask me about it because now I know so much more. It actually happened and there's so much evidence for it. So that's what our trips are about is the authority of God's word. Another framework. The Bible gives us a framework for properly understanding biology. Nehemiah 9.6 says, You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. God is the one who created life, and his fingerprints are all over that as well. In fact, today we have something called the law of biogenesis, which states that life only and always comes from pre-existing life. It is so consistent, we made a law out of it. We've never, ever seen an exception. Living things always came from something else that was living. So why do we teach in every public school, every state university? Life formed 3.8 billion years ago when non-living, dead chemicals came together just right to form a living cell. I love that story. <laughs> There's just no science behind it. Um, that's a whole other talk. But we have a law stating that life only comes from life. 
Here's a quote from an evolutionist. He said, the belief that life arose spontaneously from non-living matter is simply a matter of faith. Wait a minute, scientists don't have faith. They're in the laboratory proving things, right? No, he's admitting they have faith that it happened because they didn't see it happen. They weren't there. They can't reproduce it. The more they study it, the worse the problem gets. They're not making progress. They're almost there. No, <laughs> You talk to some people with integrity. They said, no, we're getting further away because the more we look at life, the more complex it actually is. Then we have this, Genesis 1.24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. Ten times in Genesis chapter 1, God says he created creatures to reproduce after their kind. Can they produce a variety? Oh, yeah, great variety, but always within distinct limits, and that's what we see in biology today. Today, you can breed dogs, dingoes, coyotes, and wolves, and look at these creatures. Do they look completely different from each other? No. They're pretty similar because they're the same general kind of animal. And when you breed them, you get something that looks like a hybrid. When you breed a dog and a wolf, you get a wolf dog. This is real science. It's real genetics. It's what we would expect from genetics and what we would expect from Scripture. But you can't breed the dog and the wolf and get an ostrich. <laughs> uh, that ain't going to happen because they don't have genetic information, instructions how to make beaks and feathers. So you can get a nice variety, but always within limits, and that's what biology is screaming today, and that's what the Bible said a long time ago. Leviticus 17.11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. We all know blood is very important for life. In fact, every human red blood cell contains about 270 million molecules of hemoglobin, and that's what carries oxygen throughout your body. If you had a slight amount less, you would be dead. What's interesting about that is doctors used to drain blood out of people's bodies when they got sick, get that bad blood out of them. That's largely how George Washington died. He got pneumonia. So he goes to the doctor. Oh, this guy's sick. We've got to get some of that bad blood out of him. They drained some blood. He got sicker. He's like, wow, he's really sick. They drained some more blood. He got even sicker. It's like, wow, this guy is so sick. They ended up draining almost a gallon of blood out of him, and he died. <laughs> we know why. If they would have paid attention to the Bible, the life of the flesh is in the blood, he would still be with us today. <laughs> um, so the Bible got this right a long time ago, and now they know. You know, the life of the flesh, you don't drain the blood out of someone's body. The reason I have a picture of a barber pole up here is you used to be able to go to the barber to have your blood drained. They called it bloodletting. They would give you a cylinder like that to grasp, make a fist, cut your arm, drain some blood wrap a towel around there later to help stop the bleeding and absorb some blood. Sometimes they would take the used towels, hang them outside on the cylinder to dry, and the wind would catch it, and the towel would wrap around the pole. That's why today barber poles have red stripes. Free trivia, I won't charge you for that one, but next time you see a barber pole, remember that, and think about sharing these things with your friends, especially this next thing. Exodus 15, 26, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, I will put none of these diseases upon thee. This is worth the price of admission. If you haven't heard about this one before, you're going to be smiling the rest of the week. This is amazing. So here's the background. God creates everything to begin with, and it's perfect. He creates Adam and Eve, and they're perfect. They sin. They disobey God. They think they have a, a better plan. They separate themselves from God. God could have just smashed them and started over, but he said, no, I love them too much. I have a plan. He's going to send his own son to die on a cross to pay for the sins of the world. That is the entire Old Testament, is God playing out that plan, which included him choosing a group of people, Abraham's descendants, through which his son, the Messiah, would be born. That's the whole Old Testament. The whole Old Testament is also Satan, who hates God, trying to ruin that plan. So the whole Old Testament can be summarized by Satan trying to wipe out the Jews, because if he can, the Messiah can't come. No Jews, no Messiah. And God is protecting his people throughout the Old Testament. So that's what's going on. That's the backdrop. In this context, Moses is saying, listen to <clears throat> the health practices that God is giving us, and we won't see the diseases that are affecting the nations around us. But we know from the book of Acts that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He went to Egypt, you. <laughs> Today, <laughs> if someone goes to a state university and they get a Ph.D., and then they write some books... You would expect a lot of the information in those books would come from what they learned at the university. That's just kind of how it works. Well, Moses goes to Egypt, you, and then he wrote five books. Did you know that? You probably read some of his books. <laughs> yeah, the first five books of the Bible. So do we see Egyptian wisdom in the Bible? We should if Moses made it up on his own. 
And that's what skeptics say. He was an ignorant goat herder. He just scribbled some stuff down, and now here's one more option for a religious book. Let's take a look at some Egyptian wisdom. This is the Ebers Papyrus, written about 1550 B.C., contains over 800 magical formulas and remedies for things, one of which is if you got a splinter, you're supposed to apply worm blood and donkey dung. Modern scientists say, yikes, you don't want to do that. It causes tetanus spores, you can get lockjaw, you could get very sick, you could even die. That's the kind of stuff Moses was learning. So do we see things like that in what he wrote? We should if he made it up on his own. Let's take a look at what we actually see from Moses. Moses talked about touching a dead body. Now today we know about germs and bacteria. You don't want to touch a dead animal. You could get sick from that. You could maybe even die. This is what Moses wrote about that in the book of Numbers, chapter 19. Whoever touches a dead body of anyone will be unclean for seven days must wash themselves in the water of purification on the third day and on the seventh day, and then he'll be clean. Okay, what's the water of purification? Well, a few verses earlier, he tells us. He said, the priest is to take some cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet wool, and throw them on the burning heifer or cow. That sounds bizarre. Many of you are old enough to remember the Beverly Hillbillies. It sounds like something Granny would come up with in the kitchen, put some possum in a pot, and stir it around. She was always doing weird things. That's what this sounds like, just some weird concoction. Modern scientists say, no, that's not weird at all. That's fascinating, and here's why. The cedar wood and the burning heifer or cow ashes combine to make lye, which is a caustic soda. We call it soap. <laughs> you touch a dead body, washing with soap would be a good thing. The hyssop plant converts to thiamol. That's isopropyl alcohol. It kills bacteria. <laughs> touch a dead body, killing bacteria would come in handy. The scarlet wool forms a gritty substance like an SOS pad in your kitchen or if you use orange goop that has pumice in it. It's abrasive to help scour and clean things out. And then applying it on the third and the seventh day, bacteria grow very well in a damp environment. So you want to wait a few days for everything to dry out. Then you apply this. Wait a few more days, apply it a second time, and you're considered clean. Modern scientists say that is a great natural remedy if you don't have antibiotics that we create today. Did Moses know anything about bacteria and germ theory and isopropyl alcohol? <laughs> Obviously not. This is God saying, hey, Mo, <laughs> I want you to write some things down. And so Moses writes it down, and he's probably like, that was really cool, God. You got anything else? And God says, let me think. Yeah, I got another one. <laughs> so I'm going to end with one more example, and this is fascinating as well. Moses talked about a certain Jewish tradition in Genesis 17. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Why did Moses say the eighth day? Could have said anything. Third week, the fifth year, anything. He said the eighth day. Well, modern scientists have discovered some fascinating things about blood clotting. There are two major elements in your bloodstream that are necessary to clot your blood. We have vitamin K and prothrombin. On a molecular level, there are about two dozen events that have to fire off in proper sequence to clot your blood. You miss one, you're dead. So event A has to happen first, which triggers B. B triggers C, C triggers D on down the line. How did that evolve over millions of years? By making random copying errors in the DNA, which is what mutations generally are. Uh, some creature, if it has A, B, and C by accident, it doesn't do anything. It can't clot its blood. It couldn't survive. What if it had A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Doesn't do anything. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, R, R, A, B, C, no. Two dozen in a row. You cannot evolve that by time, by random processes of nature. It's a design feature. That's a molecular level. Bring it back upstairs again. Vitamin K and prothrombin. Scientists have discovered vitamin K develops in a newborn somewhere between days five and seven. That's when it kicks in. Prothrombin looks like this if we graph it, and I will explain the graph. The dotted line across the top is the normal level of prothrombin in your body. Numbers across the bottom are days after birth. Scientists have discovered that a baby on day one has 90% of its prothrombin. That's pretty high, not bad. But then it drops dangerously low between days two and five down to only 30%. And then on day eight, it spikes to 110% percent of its normal level. It will never be that high again the rest of your entire life. 
only on day eight. <laughs> so if you are a baby and you need a surgical procedure, day eight would be the perfect day because you have vitamin K for sure by then and you have more prothrombin than you'll ever have the rest of your life. Now, Amy and I have two children. They're 28 and 26. And when our son, she was pregnant with our son, the firstborn, we went to the hospital to go through the birthing classes. And they said, if you have a baby boy and would like this procedure, we'll take him down the hall and bring him back. I remember 28 years ago being very nervous about that, thinking, shouldn't we do this on day eight? The nurse kept speaking. I was very shy. I didn't want to ask any questions. The nurse kept talking. Someone else raised their hand and said, hey, nurse, you just said you're giving this baby a shot. The baby's just born. Why would it need a shot right away? She goes, oh, that's vitamin K. All of a sudden, the, the light bulb went on in my head. My hand went up all by itself. <laughs> she called on me, and I explained to the whole class what Moses said about circumcision in the Bible on the eighth day. I don't know if they were impressed or not, but it was an opportunity to talk about the inspiration of Scripture. <laughs> um, so today, they artificially introduced the vitamin K, which is nothing wrong with that, and you have 90% of prothrombin on day one. It's not an issue to do this, but so the Bible got it right a long time ago. So the Bible passes this test of what we call scientific foreknowledge. In fact, it passes all four tests of internal consistency and historical accuracy and prophetic accuracy and scientific accuracy. So in closing, do people, do Christians have faith that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Yes, we do. But it's an incredibly reasonable faith backed up by so much evidence. We're just scratching the surface here. In fact, if you want to believe the Bible is not the inspired Word of God, in the immortal words of Ricky Ricardo, <laughs> you got a lot of splaining to do. <laughs> Seriously, if, if this is not from God and a bunch of people made it up, how did you get the 40 different authors on three different continents writing three different languages over a 1,600-year period, covering hundreds of controversial topics, yet they agree with each other in every detail? How'd you get all the prophecy right? 27% of the Bible, over 8,000 passages in here are prophetic in nature. How'd they get all that right? And the science, and on and on and on. There's so much evidence to back up the Bible's claim that it is the inspired Word of God. It takes a very unreasonable faith to say it's not, and then you have a lot of explaining to do. We have a five-part series. I don't know if you recognize this or not. It was called the DVD. We don't carry those anymore. <laughs> All of our videos are streaming now, and they're free. So we have a five-part series on the inspiration of the Bible where I talk about, like, when was the Bible written? How did they write it? How did they copy it? Did they get it right? And then the four categories of evidence are all covered in the five-part series, which is free on our website. So... As I close, I'll very quickly highlight the resources we brought along. Almost all of them are free, which is exciting. You can also get them online. There are currently 34 free streaming videos. I'll be recording maybe eight more this year, and just every time we finish one, we'll add it. And that's available for free on our website. We also have a YouTube channel with all of them. I already mentioned the podcast. There's like 52 episodes out there uh, so far, very powerful and free. Free email newsletter, you can sign up at the table or on our website, comes out once a month. Um, I write a question of the month article that's featured in the newsletter, but we're all, we also archive all the old ones online, so those are free. I did a lot of live stream broadcasts in the past. Those are archived on our website. I wrote a little pocket guide, the four categories of evidence I mentioned here this morning. They're in this little pocket guide. It mentions each category and gives you one example evidence from each one. So when you're talking to someone, you can say, hold on, I, I do believe the Bible is the Word of God, and let me just give you a few examples here. So it's very handy. Those are available on the table for free. The only thing that we sell are the books that I wrote because it costs a lot of money for us to print them and ship them, but we've greatly discounted them. You get all three for just $30, and I'm not here to raise support. We don't charge a penny. I've been speaking 39 years. We've never charged a penny. The main way our ministry exists is by getting monthly supporters, and when people sign up to be a monthly supporter, we give them the books for free. So then virtually everything we have is free. I already mentioned the Grand Canyon tour. Brochures are back there. I know this is great that your church is going as a group, but if more people want to go, we have other tours you could join in on. So with that, I have two speeds off and 50 million miles an hour, so <laughs> nothing in between. But I shared all of this this morning so that you can go out and then you can win arguments with people and make them look foolish. No, not at all. You're going to forget most of these details. That's fine. I shared this with you to strengthen your faith so that you can in turn go out and very, very graciously share the gospel message with people knowing if they bring up tough questions, and they will, and they should, you know answers exist. Even if all you remember is there was some guy, I think he had red hair, I don't know if remember his name, but he said something about the Bible. <laughs> That's fine. You know you can get answers by talking to your pastors, 
contacting our ministry or others and getting back to that person to continue to share the gospel message because you answered their question about carbon-14 dating or the Ice Age or dinosaurs or all the violence in the Bible or whatever it might be. So that's what I'm here for, to fire you up in your face so that you can in turn fulfill God's will for your life, which is to share what you've accepted in the gospel message with those around you. So I will close in a quick word of prayer. Look forward to seeing you in the lobby afterwards. And then please, 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 please do not come back tonight alone. <laughs> bring a visitor, bring a skeptic, bring an atheist. Seriously, they will be very graciously welcomed. And it's a very powerful presentation showing you how to defend the Christian worldview without having to be a rocket scientist. Very eye-opening. So again, it was a great place for skeptics to be this evening at 6 p.m. Uh, bow with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we've had to take a look at the inspiration of your word, we thank you so much for giving it to us. We thank you for your graciousness and the patience you show us each day. I pray for each person here that even this coming week, God, you would bring someone in their path who needs to hear um, the gospel message and you would help them do it very graciously and allow the Holy Spirit to do all the heavy lifting. We just pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>